Hi guys, welcome Novum. This video has actually been delayed by about a month because my lung collapsed as I began writing it, so I've been in a respiratory ward full of tubes since the beginning of March. My apologies for the delay, and many, many thanks to those of you who have left kind comments uh, on the videos. They really were manna from heaven, stuck in a hospital without visitors, so really from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I'm healing well, but if I sound a little out of breath or stuffy at points in the video, then that's why. I just got done watching The Lighthouse for the second time, so I've got even more to say than I would have done if I'd have made this a month ago. If you're not familiar with a few bits of background information, or if you're new to reading film, then The Lighthouse may have ended somewhat confusingly for you. Don't worry if it did, Robert Eggers certainly intended the ending to be open for interpretation. But fear not, I'm going to explain it all, and I think I have some pretty ironclad explanations for what's going on here. There's going to be plenty of original analysis and theorising, this isn't just regurgitated from other videos, in fact I purposefully haven't watched any, and there's hopefully going to be a lot of cool stuff to learn along the way. I'm aiming for this video to be the complete companion to the lighthouse, we're going very in depth. This video though does require us to start with a bit of a warning, there's going to be a lot of uncomfortable dialogue here because the subject matter of the film is ultimately uncomfortable. All of my videos are designed to be academic in nature, and as such I would suggest that anyone watch them that wants to learn, but in this case I would stress that if you are under 18 you are probably better off skipping this one, because we're going to be getting quite graphic. And I mean that, in places this film is extremely dark, and it's not just graphic imagery or events that I mean by dark, there's some really uncomfortable discussion of sexuality, and that can be highly likely to offend if misunderstood. I try to present my thoughts in unbiased, essay-like style, so please understand that if I'm using words like degenerate or sinful, then they are in context of the movie and are not based on any of my personal views. Alright, let's get started. The lighthouse moves sporadically between the real and unreal, and is often and deliberately confusing, at some points directly contradicting what the viewer has just seen or heard on screen. The majority of questions the film raises involve the unreal, the imagined or supernatural elements of the movie. So before we start analysing, let's attempt to clarify what the real events of the film are, by quickly building a timeline, and then we'll move on to the abstract and the supernatural, what might have happened. So we have a man named Thomas Howard, under the guise of Ephraim Winslow, taking on a lighthousing or wicking job on a remote island off the coast of New England. He has an uncomfortable working relationship with his superior, the lighthouse keeper Thomas Wake. As Howard becomes angrier with his situation, he murders a seagull, despite warnings not to from Wake. After their agreed tenure on the island is concluded, their pickup boat never arrives however, and their mental states begin to deteriorate as they descend into alcohol fueled madness. Their relationship is strained and odd at best, but we can be certain that Howard resents Wake for a great many reasons, from his bodily functions to his abusive orders. Wake and Howard's relationship comes to a violent climax, and Howard physically and potentially sexually assaults Wake before killing him and potentially dying himself. Now I've missed out a lot of the content there and kept it deliberately basic. I'm not saying for certain that all of that happened or for certain that other stuff definitely didn't. Nor indeed can we be certain that any of this is legitimately happening, as Wake suggests to Howard. But there are certain cues the film gives us through its stylized and shifting aesthetics that can aid us in determining the real from unreal. Let's look at that in a bit more detail so we can really get to grips with what's symbolic and what's literal here. The film is beautifully and meticulously shot on black and white using an orthochromatic aesthetic. What does that mean? Well, it's essentially designed to give the feel of 19th century photography which means you get shots that look like this, like source footage from the period, they look real. It also uses an intense, almost square 35mm frame. It's an incredibly narrow field of view, it controls focus and what the viewer can and can't see extremely well, always making you wonder about what's lurking just off frame, which is pretty perfect for generating paranoia and a feeling of the unknown. There are a great many technical tricks used beyond that to generate the more hyper-stylized noir shots like this, and this phenomenal shot from the climax. Tricks like reflecting intense light from different fabrics uh, that provides an unreal level of saturation and high contrast. So we have something that is at times aiming to look like a fever dream, and at other times aiming to look like historical footage. 
That on its own may not be enough, but when we look at these edits and how noticeable the snap back to reality often is in these cases, and when we consider how carefully this has been filmed, we can start to piece together what we think may have actually occurred, and what is potentially fantasy or hallucination based on when each of these aesthetics is used. In moments of lucidity and clarity amidst the drunken confusion are shown in the more realist style, and moments of madness are shown in the more high contrast noir style. We'll look at this in more detail as we go through, but for now it's something to consider while looking at these stills. Towards the end of the film, Wake says to Howard, I'm probably a figment of your imagination. This rock is a figment of your imagination too. You're probably wandering through a grove of tag alders up north in Canada like a frostbitten maniac talking to yourself, knee deep in snow. Now Wake is toying with the idea that this is all some sort of fever dream of Howard's, as the movie is tipping its hat to it all potentially being an allegory, an extended metaphor playing out on screen that doesn't want you to ever be certain of its reality. And Timber, the tag alder plant where Howard used to work, is an equally masculine and equally isolated experience to lighthouse keeping. Howard's suffering, his past, his whole situation is perpetual. It makes it much easier to imagine this as a complete metaphor or an allegorical fantasy head trip. It's difficult to imagine either character outside of this perpetual loneliness and isolation that they reside within. In fact, Howard has been doing this work in his own words since he left father his archetype masculine influence. So really we can consider this isolation as being endemic to Howard's entire masculinity, his entire adulthood. We should entertain the possibility that nearly every element of this movie isn't happening, and we know from the deliberate inconsistencies, such as they're losing weeks of time in between sentences to wait claiming Howard chopped up the boat when we clearly see him doing it, we know that we are not seeing 100% reality or supposed reality. And lastly, we know that the movie wants us to know that, that is to say it's intended subtext and it's designed to make us question what we're seeing, just as Howard does. Are the characters we're observing just contradicting themselves as they fall victim to drunken insanity? Is the film simply being inconsistent? Well, I think the pretty simple and clear answer here is that it's aiming to engender in the viewer the same confusion and anger, the same madness. We are part and parcel to their downward spiral. Just as the characters become unsure of themselves and their situation, so too do we. It's a frenzy, a brutal, maddening contradiction that can only end in the abandonment of reality and the acceptance of madness, and the film slowly plays with the audience to sow paranoia and distrust in what is being shown in order to reflect that madness. I personally believe that the elements of incongruity and inconsistency are down to us viewing the film through Howard's lens, the lens of Howard's madness. Incidentally, at the climax of the film, it is ultimately a lens that drives him over the edge. We're going to look in depth at where exactly all this madness is emanating from, Howard or Wake or alcohol or all three, as we move through, but again, for now, just keep in mind that the movie wants you to question its reality, and Robert Eggers very much intended for multiple interpretations to be at work here. So lastly for our basic section, there are a few influences and pieces of intertextuality that we should discuss to properly lay the foundations for our reading. Firstly, this film began as a screenplay adaptation of sorts from an unfinished short story by Edgar Allan Poe. There are clear parallels here, I'm sure that the adaptation process could make it for its own video, but I find it relatively straightforward and there is in my opinion a much larger piece of intertextuality lurking below the surface here. While the film may have kept the name and the setting of Edgar Allan Poe's The Lighthouse, it is in my opinion and with a great deal of admission by the director Robert Eggers, an imagining of a conflict between the ancient Greek titan Prometheus and Proteus, son of the sea god Poseidon. Now that is a very large discussion and one that will actually comprise probably most of the second half of this video. It's also going to explain all of those confusing moments like this and this. We're going to get there, but there's a bit more background to cover first as far as influences go. It would be remiss of me uh, to ignore the blatant influences of what we'll dub here as maritime masculinity. Think the old man in the sea, really think Wake, he's essentially an archetype of it. Strong both physically and mentally, a keen sense of duty and morality with a willingness to take on nature in its most terrifying and extreme forms, a frontier-like hardiness. This was a mainstay of 19th and 20th century literature. In a lot of ways, galleon captains, explorers, and men of the wilds were precursors to superheroes, action heroes, because they represented the extreme of the human condition at the time. This became extremely popular for depictions of masculinity because it presented authors' opportunity to examine strong men at the edge of their will in 
almost imaginable situations. Nature still represented a legitimate and frequent threat, one that, barring freak events, our modern comforts have mostly nullified. Man's dominion over nature, then, was a frequent concern of literature and masculinity. For example, Moby Dick, Captain Ahab's descent into madness and obsession as he attempts to enact revenge upon the titular white whale that almost certainly has influenced the lighthouse in at least some minor way. Even more relevant to us is the verse poem, The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, in which a captain slays an albatross and brings a curse upon his crew. Now, while not killing seabirds has been a long-standing tradition or superstition among sailors, I think we can say pretty certainly that Howard's murder of the gull is intended to have intertextual connotations with the rhyme of the ancient mariner. But most importantly, most notably, is the work of Ernest Hemingway, the most popular American author of the 20th century and perhaps all time. I've dubbed it maritime masculinity, but Hemingway is so pervasive in this genre that many scholars, especially students of Hemingway, will refer to it simply as Hemingway masculinity. I haven't here because I think the influences extend beyond Hemingway in the case of The Lighthouse, and his body of work is so large that I think it's in better judgement just to leave his term for his work. But undoubtedly, without Hemingway, this film looks extremely different, and potentially it doesn't even exist. And it's not just that Defoe looks like a perfect blend between Hemingway and Poseidon, or that both characters would fit perfectly inside one of his texts, or indeed that both are archetypal of Hemingway masculinity in their own rights. It is in fact due to an, an enormous wave of responses from later critics and scholars that Hemingway, the archetypal masculine author, that his body of work was in fact filled with repressed homosexuality. Now this could be its own video again, but it's safe to say that uh, questions like, was Hemingway himself gay, or is X character actually a closeted homosexual? Whatever you can imagine, it's probably been explored in academic literature. Now, I don't personally ascribe to it with Hemingway, but that's just me and many, many critics would disagree. And really, what's important to us right now is that that conversation exists, because it's a huge influence in this movie and the homosexual tension that plays out under the surface. Outside of Hemingway, it's become a pretty large trope, even a point of comedy in many places, that sailors, the navy, etc. are places where homosexuality is practiced with arguable levels of secrecy. You may have also heard of sailors being stereotyped simply as being promiscuous, with parts garnering reputations for brothels and sexual infections, and there is a lot of historical and even contemporary accuracy there. There's also repeated stories of the increasingly strange sexuality of sailors, from things like certain tricks sailors would use to mimic intercourse, to being driven mad to the point of imagining fish women to breed with. Even Barney in How I Met Your Mother has his uh, mermaid theory regarding people you've known for a long time becoming sexually attractive through the lens of your own growing frustration. Really, the lesson from all of this is that isolation, removal from traditional society, and all male social groups removed from women have a reputation for doing strange things to male sexuality. And please, as we move forward, be aware that I'm not saying homosexuality is strange or abnormal, nor am I saying that this even represents what traditional homosexuality is. I think in some cases it may be, and in other cases, potentially as we see here, that this is something else entirely something that we uh, could uncomfortably liken to prison homosexuality, something more barbaric and urgent that is focused on gratification. That may not make sense right now, but fear not, it segues us nicely into the first half of our discussion. As you may have noticed, this film is extremely concerned with sexuality. There's almost no discussion of it between the characters, something very much worth noting because outside of the dialogue the film is genuinely obsessed with it. I'm going to try and take Howard's journey into psychosexual insanity as it unfolds in the film, so let's start at the start with the film developing a definite bond between Howard's sexuality and the sea. The ocean that surrounds his lighthouse, keep that in mind as well. The hole Howard finds the scrimshaw in looks like one cut for the purpose of a masturbatory aid, even stuffed with a simulacrum of pubic hair. Howard's predecessor clearly struggled with the same sexual frustrations and supposed deviancies. The scrimshaw itself is a pornographic depiction of a bare-breasted mermaid. It's not a woman, let's be very clear on that. It's a bastardised version of womanhood, bastardised by the sea, by the isolation and frustration that both Howard and his predecessor share. Perhaps they've forgotten the true image of womanhood, perhaps they've actually developed a growing attraction to the notion of fish parts. It doesn't really matter. What's important is that their image of sexual desire has, has begun to grow unnatural. For now though, let's focus on the ocean and their sexualities being linked. 
sailors and homosexuality, the tradition of male sexual deviancy in isolated settings, and so on. So shortly after finding it, he sees, or rather hallucinates, the mermaid as he approaches the ocean. Here, she is not just scrimshaw, she is a fully realised siren, and again, bare-breasted. There is another concerning link at play in Howard's sexuality, and we get a quick flash of it here for the first time, that of Winslow. Howard hallucinates the back of his head very briefly before seeing the nude siren, and here the film is very cleverly letting us know right from the off that these things are all linked in the growing concern of Howard's sexuality. When we see Howard masturbating for the first time using the mermaid, the sound of his ejaculation is replaced or mimicked by the sound of waves breaking, just like his anger is signposted by the loud foghorn siren. His emotions, his intimacies, his aggressions, they're all marked by the sea. And this starts to feed into the idea that all of this nautical nastiness that we see is representative of his growing sexual frustration and the conflicts of desire between hetero and homosexuality at work within him. So our first real piece of this weirdness comes from Howard observing Wake stripping naked in the lantern room, followed by nightmares of tentacles and a mermaid. Now as we've covered, and as will apply to everything from now on, we can't really be certain of this reality, but we can be relatively certain of the reality that we're looking through the lens of Howard's madness. For now, mainly just because we're seeing events from his point of view consistently. Whether that's madness that's entirely in his head and completely imagined, madness that is a skewed perception of what he's actually seeing, or simply madness that exists within him but is parallel to the actual real oddness he is witnessing, is unforeseen, and for the most part it's largely up to you. So in this case, of Howard observing Wake, this leaves us really three options. One, he didn't see Wake doing anything, this situation exists entirely in Howard's mind. Two, he is seeing the situation exactly as it's occurring, supernatural elements and all. Or three, which is what I subscribe to, he did spy on Wake, and in his madness, uh, he creates the nudity and the tentacled oddity. He observes maybe Wake stripping, and the extra tentacle stuff is the product of his fear and madness. Maybe he doesn't observe him stripping at all, and he just imagines Wake in this sexually strange context. Now it's important to note here that whether you consider this the starting point of Howard's mental decline, or his finding of the erotic mermaid scrimshaw moments before, it's definitely a sexual catalyst that triggers this, and that's going to be an intrinsic part of Howard's character moving forward. This is psychosexual decline, either he's imagining or actually witnessing Wake Naked engaging in these semi-mystical sex acts, it's not really of much importance, but the deliberate sexual connotation is. However you look at this, it undoubtedly starts with a sexual trigger, and before we get to all of the cool Greek mythology stuff, we need to get into the nitty gritty of the confusing sexualities that propel this movie forward. And once again, I'm going to remind you that this is an uncomfortable movie, and as we unpack it, this is going to be more graphic. A short time later, we see Howard stare at Wake's behind through a hole in the roof, as he either writhes in his sleep or is potentially having sex with his own hole in a mattress. Howard seems angry, but at the same time, he's intrigued. He seems to resent Wake any kind of sexual gratification, yet he can't help himself feel desire as Wake slowly becomes another object, and eventually the target, of his sexual confusion and his lust. This becomes crucial because it's essentially the same thing as his jealousy and their battle over the light. So again, please keep that in mind moving forward. But for now though, let's look specifically at Howard's homosexuality. At its most pervasive, you could consider all of the supernatural, psychosexual confusion as manifestations of Howard's battle with a repressed homosexuality. The tentacles, the mermaid, Winslow, uh, they're all just manifestations of his unreconciled or repressed homosexuality. We know he's struggling with his sexuality, and that the mermaid woman offers him an escape, but that escape is becoming increasingly more perverted and unnatural, no longer resembling womanhood, but still something sexual to engage with that isn't a man. As Howard tries his best to cling to his fantasies, they become more and more invaded by Wake, Sirens, Tentacles, and the violent murder of Winslow. It's unclear, and indeed perhaps troubling to discuss, what kind of homosexuality this may be. We can also say for certain that Howard is, at the very least, having homosexual urges, not just through his voyeurism of Wake, as we just mentioned, but many more clear-cut pieces of evidence that we're going to look through as we move forward. But let's discuss the idea of homosexualities, that is to say, differing understandings and interpretations of what homosexuality is. Now you can study this in almost every society and historical culture, it's fair to say that wherever and whenever you look, you'll find different understandings of what homosexuality is. 
For now though, we'll keep it simple and assume two definitions. Homosexuality as we know it, uh, wherein a man loves a man simply because he does, and we will refer to that as legitimate homosexuality. We will also assume another sort, which is homosexuality by necessity. So this is our isolated sailors, our prison homosexuality, and things of that sort. A non-romantic, or not necessarily romantic, use of the male body as a source of immediate and often violent gratification. Now, whichever is the case here, it's certain that this would be, at the time, an extremely serious and troubling thing for a young man to be feeling. There are many, many cases of repressed homosexuality, especially in servicemen, causing extreme psychological harm and many suicides. For example, following World War I, many scholars and historians, such as Elaine Showalter, have identified so-called shell shock or PTSD sufferers as young men who were unable to reconcile with homosexual acts they had engaged in while overseas at war, developing intimate relationships with fellow soldiers in life or death situations. Many of these cases seem to belong to the legitimate homosexuality side, and many seem to belong to the homosexuality by necessity side. I only bring this up because it's extremely significant in terms of how we should view these emotions in context in the film, and because it demonstrates the stark consequences of such a violent inner struggle at work within a young man like Howard, as he struggles between homosexuality and reflex violence. At such a time in history, the shame of these feelings would very much be enough to lash out and even murder someone, and seemingly it's something Howard cannot avoid as he hurtles towards this psychosexual insanity. Now, if you do subscribe to Wake's suggestion that all of this is in Howard's mind, then I think here we have the struggle that his mind may be battling over, an inner turmoil over potential legitimate homosexual desire and Howard's inability to accept it in himself. In this reading, perhaps Winslow is his former lover, whom he murdered again due to his inability to reconcile his homosexuality. Perhaps Wake is someone at his logging camp who he has confusing feelings for. Whatever the case, if you do subscribe to this reading, then the ending provides a pretty bleak answer as to whether or not Howard was able to accept this part of himself. It would also explain why his death is so abstract and confusing in how he is placed there. This is a death of the self. He looked into the light. He potentially penetrated a man, or at the very least fantasised about it, and ultimately he was not able to accept it in himself. Now I personally don't subscribe to this thinking, I think the reading goes a bit too far into the unreal there, but I do think there is a definite homosexual subtext at work here, and that eventually erupts into a full physical rape. I think that Howard's homosexuality is one of desperation, one of being completely removed and remote from women, while being filled with an overt sexual energy. I think he tries to cling to the heterosexual parts of his sexuality, as we see with his repeated masturbation to the mermaid scrimshaw, but he eventually succumbs to his own desires as his sexuality becomes more and more perverted with his violence and his ocean-based isolation. As I've mentioned before, the image of the siren is a deliberately bastardised version of womanhood, and Howard's first real interaction with her is very telling. When we see her first in detail, Howard's first response is to start caressing her naked, unconscious body, so that's another plus one for his sexual frustration, but the camera focuses slowly on the hand around the throat, and it's somewhere between a choke and a caress that shows the violent sort of confusion at work in his sexuality. His hand moves to the breast, and then there's a stark, confronting shot of the gill. It's deliberately jarring, deliberately non-human. His isolation and perhaps his innocence, combined with the fantasies surrounding his scrimshaw, have perverted his desire. His brain is creating a new fiction to combat his loneliness, and in all probability to mask his own homosexual desire. These fantasies start to become more outlandish as he imagines more visceral images of the mermaid and himself engaged in sexual acts. While masturbating later on, Howard struggles as his internal fantasies become more confused. He is trying to focus on this bastardised imagining of womanhood, the siren, but as he does so, he begins to see Ephraim Winslow, the man he potentially killed. This is definitely again demonstrating that whatever happened with Winslow is part and parcel of his sexual confusion. It is likely that maybe there was some sexuality between Howard and Winslow that Howard could not accept in himself. Concerned of his sins and angry perhaps at Winslow's higher station and more comfortable wealth, he committed a murder out of fear self-hatred or jealousy, and here with Wake we see shades of that repeating. Howard's confused attraction towards him, jealousy over what Wake has that he doesn't, and his confusing sexual downward spiral being linked to his increasing violence. When he is unable to complete due to the increasingly confusing imagery interrupting his fantasies, he smashes the scrimshaw and screams in anger and then stabs it with his broken knife. 
Again, this is just more evidence that for Howard, sexuality and violence are intrinsically linked. And perhaps the broken knife, the knife traditionally a phallic object, showing that there is some sort of damage to his sexuality. Throughout this sequence, we see a repeated shot of Howard dragging the lobster cages up the cliff. At first, this seems like repeated depictions of his labour, but given his frustration and violent elimination of the mermaid scrimshaw, it would seem more like a violent attempt to capture the real mermaid, or the siren as it's known here, so he can presumably either kill or rape her. Now this cements a couple of things for us. One, that Howard's violent fantasies are not simply fantasies. He acts on them and uses violence as a means for sexual access. He stabs at the scrimshaw and then attempts to capture the real icon for rape. This again suggests something sexual happened with Winslow, and please bear in mind this scene is also the most we see of Winslow's murder, right in the middle of Howard's masturbatory fantasy. Shortly before this, Howard described Winslow as a candy bastard. Candy has had a few slang meanings over the years, but the most presumable connotation here is homosexual or otherwise soft. I'm sure you'll recognise your candy ass from various 90s action films. The knowledge that Winslow was perhaps homosexual, in Howard's eyes at least, that something that Howard perhaps resents him for, I think is solid proof for the whole repressed homosexuality and Winslow murder theory. Especially when we later see Howard's homosexual interactions with Wake also turn to violence in the face of denial and repression in the form of their manly fistfight. When we see Howard killing Winslow, he is penetrating him from behind with a spear, which is pretty simple yet unpleasant subtext. When he spies on Wake during the tentacle sex ritual, we see goopy fluid dripping down on Howard. Now a few things of note here. One, the black and white inevitably makes this look potentially semen-like, not just tentacle fluid-like, and that is certainly intentional. As we saw with the white and black marbling of the urine and feces in the septic tank, this is something the film is directly aware of and in control of. But given that the tentacles and such, perhaps the entire event, are the hallucinations or imagining of Howard, then this could simply be what's happening, that he's getting semen dropped on him. If Howard is actually witnessing this, then Wake likely is masturbating up there and the semen is the truth behind Howard's madness. As with everything here, we can't be certain, but given how much the film wants us to focus on Howard being literally and metaphysically beneath Wake, concentrating on covering him in Wake's farts and excrement, it would seem like this is the likely answer. And it fits with our theory of Howard repressing or masking homosexual urges with this nautical weirdness. Here, rather than admit the truth of spying on Wake's self-abuse due to his own frustrations, he imagines the sea-based pseudo-sexuality offered by his pornographic mermaid scrimshaw. He starts to imagine, out of desperation and repression, some sort of mystical sex ritual that the owner or keeper of the light is privy to. And that's really important because it cements the link between the light and sexuality. A huge, huge part of this is that he is convinced that Wake is somehow hoarding or keeping this sexual outlet for himself, that the top of the lighthouse is home to some bizarre mating between Wiki and Mermaid. It would seem to him, although it's left unspoken, that the Keeper of the Light seemingly has sexual access to this creature or creatures, and it, this fuels his jealousy of Wake. Howard's predecessor supposedly died in madness, raving about sirens, mermaids and the like. He believed that there was some enchantment in the light. Now there is a very clear link between the siren and the light that Wake puts into Howard's head very early on. We know from the scrimshaw and the hole in the mattress that Howard's predecessor was suffering from the same sexual frustrations, and here we see Howard become convinced that the light may lead him to the siren, to sexual contact with the feminine, escape from his encroaching homosexual frustrations and his earthly struggle for transgression of his position. Now this is extremely important and we're going to get to it. The film is wonderful at intertwining meanings and madness, so I have to be careful in how we unpack it. For now though, just please don't feel as though I'm ignoring his jealous desire of Wake to simply focus on homosexuality. In many ways it's far more important than the sexual narratives here, but we need to understand the basic desires at work so we can fully understand the allegory as we unpack it. Back to Howard's struggling desires, and we have a very uncomfortable scene with Howard and Wake drunk and becoming physical with one another. Now it's not dwelled on, but at the same time it's extremely purposeful and it's shown with clarity. It begins with Wake calling Howard pretty as a picture, and although it's a joke, Howard displays clear discomfort. There are a few more very slight hints at sexuality throughout their drunken conversation, and as they become completely unintelligible through madness, drink and rage, they share a moment where they almost kiss, a surprisingly tender and loving moment that very quickly turns into realisation, denial and a physical fight. This is undoubtedly an example of their struggling 
and isolated sexualities, followed by their violent dismissal of any potential homosexuality. During their almost kiss, Wake seems as eager as Howard to engage, and this isn't necessarily a thorn on our side here regarding the whole ending rape. Just because you may want to kiss someone in a moment of drunken loneliness does not mean you would necessarily like to be forcibly sodomized while being leashed like a dog. Um, maybe Wake does legitimately harbour homosexual urges like Howard does. They've both spent their adult lives surrounded by men. It's unlikely that he hasn't considered it at the very least, but there are some key differences between the two characters. We only have knowledge of Howard knowing men. He mentions his father, Winslow, never mentions a woman. He doesn't ever speak even of the siren out loud, and he has plenty of reason to as he begins to question the reality of that situation. As a side note, we also never hear him discuss his own sanity, even though just like the sexuality, it is a prime focus of the film. And just like the homosexuality, I think the locus of madness here can be placed at Howard's door, not Wake's, given his total reluctance to discuss either. I believe he engaged in some kind of homosexual behaviour with Winslow. It also seems clear he perhaps hasn't had to sex with a woman before at all. He is inquisitive and virginal almost when asking Wake if he feels shame when laying with a woman. Now Wake, on the other hand, was married for 12 or 13 years and frequently speaks about pretty girls from his past. Sometimes it seems like he's making it up, but it's still a focus of his and it's still something he talks about. So sure, maybe they do almost kiss and it's reciprocal. That very much fits with everything we're saying here. But I also think it's very likely, given how drunk Howard is during this scene and how we know we're viewing from his biased and untrustworthy perception, that this could be a case of him drunkenly thinking Wake is reciprocal, when in fact this moment is mostly his drunken lens, an indicating beacon on the horizon of sexual assault, a troubling signal rather than a light of reassurance. Given the ending of the movie, I think there is real credence to this notion. It consistently demonstrates a willingness to flat out lie to you, and I think this may well be one of them. Either way though, it demonstrates Howard as 100% harbouring homosexual desires. This is the most clear the film makes it, and it's immediately followed up by them having a fist fight. That restorative masculine action designed to supposedly bring back their heteronormativity. A traditional masculine pursuit to repress the homosexual desire, an act of self-denial and social restoration, but also another way of touching each other's bodies, an excise of the self with another man still, and afterwards they go back to cuddling. Now, just as I mentioned before where we have the dual filming aesthetics as a metric to measure between the real and unreal, let's consider that solely through the lens of Howard's sexuality. All the unreal of it, whether that is him imagining his way to orgasm using some saucy scrimshaw, or his vivid hallucinations of fish vagina, all of his unreal sexuality is gynocentric, it's yonic. In other words, it's directed towards women and the vagina. Albeit a confusing, murky, isolated representation of womanhood, one that is becoming less and less recognisable as feminine, and more as fish as his isolation and frustrated desires begin to worsen. But all the real of it, the sexuality that is actually engaged in upon the island, be that Wake's nude ceremony in the bull broom, Howard's frequent masturbation, whatever occurred with Howard's predecessor, the almost kiss between Howard and Wake, Howard's watching of Wake's posterior through the roof, and most certainly, the potential rape, all of the actual sexuality is 100% male and homosexual for the most part. As it must be, there are no women anywhere near this island, fishtailed or otherwise. And when we compare these instances with the aesthetic choices I mentioned before, you'll see very quickly that this is a definite tale of homoerotic desire being forcefully pushed down and swallowed back as Howard tries to retain a semblance, even a horrific, bastardized, fish-based semblance of heteronormativity. And if you think that's really, really weird, well, you're not wrong, but damn does it make for some intense and captivating filmmaking. And this tense, sexual and violent relationship between Howard and Wake continues towards its climax, with Howard ultimately subduing Wake physically and abusing and murdering him. And in my opinion, at least, raping him. This, despite happening off screen, I think it's as purposeful as the almost kiss they share. To quickly cover why I think that is, we know that these physical cues from Howard represent his sexual frustration, and him potentially being about to act on his desires. In response to Wake having him bark earlier, Howard also begins treating Wake as if he is a dog. The rollover comment is therefore a little bit disguised inside of this dog-centric language, but ultimately I think the command is clear in its meaning. He wants Wake to roll over, as he is now in a submissive state. This is the culmination of Howard's jealousy and rage. 
and just like his final accessing of the lamp room, here we do see his desires fulfilled. He loses full account of himself and he takes what he wants. And when we now view the ending scene in context, we can draw the conclusion that he was in some way looking for an escape from his own homosexual confusion through the promise of feminine, maybe even mystical sexuality. His predecessor had described the light as salvation, and that is in every possible way what Howard's character is seeking. He of course does not find that, and is left in death or madness faced with the reality that he has likely raped and murdered two men, Wake and previously Winslow, due to his inability to reconcile his own desires. Ultimately, Howard believes, as his predecessor did, that his sexuality will find some form of salvation, pure and unashamed release in the light. Depending on your reading, this belief may be in the form of the siren, or regular womanhood, or acceptance and understanding of his legitimate homosexual desire. For me though, it's a combination of all of it. It's chaotic, impure, violent, barbaric release. It's the rape, it's his stabbing at the scrimshaw, it's Howard finally being able to exact desires exactly as he wants them. His madness overwhelming his fear or his self-loathing. I don't think it's as clear cut or linear as it being a return to female sexuality or him accepting his own homosexuality. I think it's a convergence of everything he's been pushing down. A complete psychosexual degeneration and loss of self. Critics have been widely accepting of the homosexual narratives at work in the movie, but Eggers has refused to state explicitly one way or another, refuting such binary definitions as straight or gay. I think the work we've done here provides a lot of clarity on this, and it's why complex analysis like this is crucial to understanding what's going on. It's why you can do a lot more with an hour-long video versus a 2,000 word article. One final note on homosexuality in the movie, and I know this may make some of you groan, uh, it's definitely intentional though, so we should discuss it briefly. The lighthouse is 1000% a phallic object, not just in shape or structure, but in its day-to-day -day hardships. It's a tough, masculine environment that only tough, masculine men can survive within. It's a thrusting beacon of human endeavour and male fortitude, just like Hemingway was obsessed with. Perhaps unlike Hemingway though, this film is very much aware of its homosexual underpinnings, and the lighthouse becomes ironic as well as iconic, not just a symbol of masculine endeavour, but also a symbol of masculine desire. If you're someone that generally argues against phallic symbolism, then consider this sequence where Howard masturbates himself into a fury, and we are shown this imagery of a lighthouse moving from sort of a hanging to an erect position. The scene cuts before it becomes vertical, uh, fully vertical, quite deliberately. The motion it gives off is that it's spinning, but it doesn't actually spin in its centre. It spins so the lighthouse resembles a growing erection, literally in the middle of a masturbation montage. So we have a huge penis metaphor, with Howard's character seeking salvation from the tip. One could even say the bulb, and no I don't think that's an accident, just as it's no accident that we see this film through the lens of Howard's madness, and ultimately the lens causes the likely fatal fall we see him take. According to Robert Pattinson, Eggers had made it very clear in the original script that the lighthouse was intended to represent an erect penis. In fact, in the original script, as we saw the lighthouse becoming erect, we were actually also going to see shots of Howard's growing erection. Um, this shot was eventually cut by the request of the film's financiers, but this confirms that this isn't sort of just pulled out of thin air. Howard has sought to transgress his situation, he sought salvation, he sought the light for himself, and here really what that means is he sought to combat, to salve, or to embrace perhaps his own sexuality. But when he stares into it, he cannot cope with what he sees, and he ends the film in Promethean torment. Having gained what he sought, he is now perpetually at the mercy of that truth, that truth he cannot live with or reconcile. Ultimately, the Promethean fire here, the light, the release at the tip of this giant phallic object, is, is not knowledge, it's just sexual release. Really, that's what this movie is. It's an exploration into isolation, frustration, and psychosexual torment that demonstrates the darkness and depravity that can occur when sexuality is repressed or otherwise forcibly absent. Whether this is due to unreconciled homosexuality or simply sheer loneliness in the absence of the feminine, the outcome is the same. We'll touch on this a bit more, but for now we've covered how sexuality informs almost every part of this movie. So let's look at all of that deeper metaphor that's at work here, that of Proteus and Prometheus. And when we combine this understanding of repressed and violent sexuality with all the metaphor and allegory, we'll be able to put it together and step back to see clearly what the film is really saying.
So, as I mentioned at the start, Eggers stated in an interview with Vox that this is an imagining of a meeting between Proteus and Prometheus. Now, they're two characters that never really coincided in ancient Greek mythology. This is unsurprising, when we consider all the titans and their families and all the gods and their many familial links, demigods, nymphs, dryads, we could go on and on, but the overall pantheon is vast, so it's not really significant that there's no existing interaction between them. For those unaware, there is a significant focus on hierarchy within ancient Greek mythology, the gods high up on Mount Olympus, man toiling on Earth, and the underworld of Hades representing the land of the dead. But prior to Olympus, the situation is a little bit more confusing. We start with Gaia, the Earth, and Uranus, the Sky, the Great Mother and the Great Father. Now, the start of Titan mythology is slightly difficult to reckon with, because we have intangible concepts like the Sky being highly personified, thoughts, feelings, actions, chaotic and powerful forms that conversate and engage in relationships. But as the Titans breed down a generation, we see them taking on more anthropomorphic forms. Although they're still quite abstract, transforming size and shape as mythological ancient beings so often do, it becomes much easier though to imagine them interacting, and indeed birthing the pantheon of gods, that we are recognised from these now more human-like shapes. For example, Helios, the sun, is a very bright-skinned titan that rides across the sky in a blazing chariot. Uh, Greek mythology is a sincere passion of mine, so it's difficult to not sidetrack here, but to keep this focused, all you really need to know is that the titans mostly suck, Zeus gets born, and pretty much spells the end of all of them. He essentially performs a titan c-section, and all but one of the gods of Olympus come bursting into the world, and pretty quickly from there, things descend into violent elimination of the titans. They're mostly murdered, and otherwise subjugated by the gods of Olympus, pretty catastrophically so in fact. One of those gods of Olympus, Poseidon, has many children, as gods are prone to do, and one of those children is named Proteus, a being that Homer referred to as the Old Man of the Sea. Now, if you think back to us discussing Hemingway and maritime literature at the start, you'll remember me mentioning the Old Man and the Sea there. That in itself was referencing Homer and Proteus, so we've got a big circle of influences going on here, as we see Wake, our Old Man and the Sea-like masculinity, metaphorically representing the character of Proteus. Incidentally, the word Protean has come to mean versatile, or something with sort of shape-shifting characteristics. We do see Wake shapeshift here when he is at his most Protean, I have seen theories uh, recently where they believe this to be evidential of Wake actually being Proteus, that he has been shapeshifting as the Siren and so on in order to drive Howard insane or perhaps lure him into some sort of interbreeding nightmare. I think this is mostly incorrect. I think the supernatural here is 100% psychological, the lens of Howard's madness. But the shapeshifting Protean connotations are purposeful. I just don't think they're evidence of actual shapeshifting. Instead, more the constantly shifting perception of Wake and Howard's mind, the shifting roles that Wake has come to represent, an object of desire and yet one of disgust, something Howard feels intimacy and hatred for, uh, jealousy and fear, sex and violence, the dichotomous sexual conflict driving his character forward that he can't reconcile with. That's what's protean here, and that's why we see these forms represented during this sequence. I tell you that uh, now rather than later on, just to demonstrate why it's important to unpack these things in the right order. If our reading was only concerned with Greek mythology, then I think it would be fair to potentially conclude Wake is a shapeshifter and some really strange supernatural stuff is going on. But there's clearly more to the movie than that, and here is a prime example. Yes, we have shifting protean aspects to Wake, but as we've come to understand, those aspects are from Howard's lens. This protean conflict and what Wake means is part of Howard's increasing sexual confusion, not evidence of shapeshifting. So that's Proteus covered, as much as we need to. Uh, now for Prometheus, a character who has been the darling of literature for over 2,000 years. It is in fact recognised as a literary tradition, not just a mere trope. From Homer and Ovid to Shelley to uh, The Lighthouse, most of our primary resource information on Prometheus comes from a 5th century tragedy called Prometheus Bound. But let's just say that in comparison to Proteus, Prometheus is extremely well fleshed out as a character. It's still based on multiple interpretations, a little Protean in their own right, but more so than Proteus, we have a good idea of the kind of guy Prometheus was. Everyone loves Prometheus because of what he represents, forbidden knowledge. Uh, in many ways, along with Pandora, he represents the notion of original sin in ancient Greece. So let's back up 
And remember how I said the Titans were subjugated by the Olympians following their war? Well, Zeus, who was by this point literally trying his hardest to have sex with every living thing in existence, visits a Titan named Prometheus, who was well regarded for his intelligence, and tasks him with creating humanity out of water and clay. Prometheus does so, and I think we can all agree he did a pretty decent job on the whole. Prometheus certainly thought so as well, as he developed quite a soft spot for humanity. Zeus, who had usurped power away from those who had birthed him, wasn't so keen on humans maybe doing the same to him in the future, and preferred to keep them walking around in the dark. In the story, this is a literal darkness, but one that very openly is a metaphor for civilized society and intelligent thought. A darkness like we associate with the grinding halt of progress experienced during the Dark Ages. Prometheus doesn't think it's fair that humanity should wander around bumping into each other in perpetual ineptitude, and so he scales Olympus and takes their fire. Now this is a literal fire when he takes it, a literal remedy to the light, but he gifts it to man in the form of civilization, their relative modernity. He gives man the ability to ponder and philosophize and build a better future, and Zeus is pissed off to say the least. That fire, the idea of knowledge we were never meant to have, something above the natural, something higher within us that drives us forward, is known as Promethean fire, or sometimes Promethean light. Now if things were so simple, Prometheus would never have become such a literary darling. Promethean knowledge is in almost every case a double-edged sword. Now for Prometheus, that means spending the rest of his days strewn across rocks being picked apart by birds in the most appalling manner, only to be reborn again in the same torment the next day. Very much like the perpetual agony we see Howard, our Prometheus suffering at the end of the film. For the most part though, that double-edged sword of Promethean fire isn't as simple as you get picked apart by birds. In most cases, it will play on the notion that the Promethean knowledge being accessed should purposefully be kept from humanity. Frankenstein, for example, it, subtitled beautifully in my opinion, or a modern Prometheus. As we know, Victor Frankenstein probably shouldn't have reanimated the dead, because it just turns out to be ultimately quite problematic and a drain on everyone involved. Once Victor has access to the knowledge, he can't unaccess it, and he is then at the mercy of his creation to create another animated life form. While we as humans may consider Prometheus a nice guy for the gifts he gave us, the gods saw it as a direct breach of the natural order, something that would ultimately remove their influence as rational thought started to become championed over religious fervour. So you have to keep in mind that while giving humanity civility was good, when we're discussing Promethean knowledge or fire or light, we're almost certainly talking about something going against the natural order. And Howard, our uh, Prometheus, is consistently positioned against the natural order. Let's get it out of the way first, his homosexuality. Now I'm not saying homosexuality is against any kind of natural moral code. It was however very much considered to be so during the time and culture in which the film was set. He fantasizes about sex with fish women, his bastardized fantasy of womanhood, and that again can certainly be considered as against the natural order. Even more importantly, he is a rapist and a murderer, and not just a murderer of people, but of gulls too, something Wake specifically warns him against. Our Prometheus begins his defiance of the gods by smashing a bird to death. It is important to note that not only was Prometheus not a big fan of his perpetual tormentors, he was also attributed with bringing in the notion of animal sacrifice into Greek mythology. The gull murder is another sort of full cycle of referencing between ancient Greek mythology and the literature of maritime masculinity. If you recall me mentioning the rhyme of the ancient mariner, we see something very similar play out with Howard and the gulls. Lastly, on the subject of Howard, Prometheus, and the Natural Order, there is some attention paid to the notion of whether or not Howard is a God-fearing man. At the surface level, they're discussing Christianity, but as we go through here, I'll demonstrate that in this case, God and the gods are relatively interchangeable. In both cases, they are a damning, vengeful deity, or deities, an active rather than benign force. So when we hear Wake ask Howard if he's a praying man, and Howard replies, not as often as he might, we know that while he isn't outright admitting it, he's not on friendly terms with God, or in the context of Prometheus and Proteus, with THE gods. But Howard goes on to say that he's God-fearing, if that's what you're asking. Now on the surface level, given his murder of Ephraim Winslow and his later actions against Wake, I think we can assume he isn't particularly. Atheism would be almost unheard of, and would be repressed or hidden just like homosexuality. So on the surface level, there's another plus point for Howard going against the natural order. But in the context of our metaphor, this can be taken literally. He may not like them, but he is certainly afraid of the gods enough to respect their power, just as the Titans were, just as Prometheus was. And this actually explains some of the weirder moments of their conflict. 
Both men at times seem to tower over the other, and at other times cower in fear of the same man. This becomes a lot less confusing when read in the context of Proteus and Prometheus. The Titans, Howard, were physically much stronger and larger, but following the massacre of their race in the war with Olympus, and the powerful magic practiced by the Olympians, they were subservient to the gods. This is pretty much the situation we see Howard trapped him. He can easily overpower Wake, but doing so will remove him of his station, something very important to Howard that we're going to look at in detail. When Wake lashes out physically at Howard, we see him become fearful of a violent reaction, which Howard eventually provides him. Wake frequently says that the light is his, and here the light clearly represents the usurpation of power from the gods, from Wake, and subsequently it is his reason enough, a reason alone, for him to become physically violent. The loss of it would mean the loss of his station, his power, everything he has. Proteus may, may have authority over Prometheus as a god, but Prometheus is far stronger and can only endure so much torment. We see them come to legitimate argument whenever the possession of the light is brought up. So Howard is God-fearing in that he is assuming of God's power, but he is certainly not a man that has led a good life as we would usually assume God-fearing to mean. There is actually a prayer that Wake uses as a toast, should pale death with treble dread, that Howard attempts and then supposedly gets wrong and forgets. It sounds like an old maritime saying, but it includes a direct beseechment of God and can therefore be considered a prayer. Now, we can see this as evidence that he isn't really a praying man, he doesn't remember the prayer, that's simple. But at the climax of the film, after burying an axe into Wake's face, and shortly before drinking lamp oil, he recites it perfectly, not as beseechment, but as a mockery or as resignation to the horror of his acts. This is huge in context, because it demonstrates him not as someone unaware or forgetful of God or the gods, but someone in opposition to them, someone who knows and understands the threat they impose on him, but defies them anyway. Just like our boy Prometheus, Howard is going to take what he wants even though he's very aware of the moral and spiritual consequences. In opposition to this, Wake is frequently portrayed as being God-fearing, respectful of the natural order, giving prayers and warnings over things that might anger the gods. On the subject of killing gulls, he warns that a northeasterly wind will come blowing like Gabriel's horn, which is pointedly biblical in its phrasing. This repeated warning of the damning fury of the gods is because he is the gods, subtextually speaking, frequently reminding man or the titans of the terrible power he has over them. Although, as we come to see, these threats are largely empty in the face of brute force or overwhelming violence, Wake respects the natural order because the natural order provides him power and station over Howard. Now, I just brought humanity into the mix there, and I think it's important to point out why. This may sound confusing at first, but hopefully it'll make sense in a second. Howard is representative of Prometheus, yes, but he is also representative of humanity, the recipient of Prometheus's gift, for the most part. That is, humanity under Olympus, humanity under the gods. The Titans are a little bit superfluous to the discussion. Prometheus is a friend of humanity, he's often mistaken as human, and he's often depicted as essentially looking like an old human man. Both humans and titans are subservient to the gods, and below them on the mythological hierarchy. Although obviously titans are vastly more powerful than humans, in many ways we can recognise Howard as representing both Prometheus and the humans that receive the forbidden knowledge. The same could be said for Victor Frankenstein, and so on and so on. I'll demonstrate in detail as we move forward, but just so we've got this set in stone, let's look quickly at a beautiful hallucinatory sequence from Two Thirds In. A shirtless Willem Dafoe, looking full Poseidon, puts his hand down in a deliberately godlike stance to Howard, who, in his hallucination, has just lowered his hand down to another version of himself. And really this is confusing imagery, because at no other point do we get any indication of another Howard. There's no obsession with him seeing reflections of himself or any of the tropes we would usually expect if this was some commentary on uncovering another part of himself. What we do have in this scene is an extremely clear focus on hierarchy, starting with an imposing godlike wake at the top and then moving down to two almost identical Howards, one helping the other one up, and that is Prometheus helping humanity while being damned by the gods. And that is why we have two Howards, because he is at once representative of Prometheus and the humanity he is enabling. That's what this scene is designed to show us. And legitimately, if anyone has an alternate reading on it, I'd love to hear them. But I struggle to come up with anything else, and this fits so perfectly, I think even without it, it would be fair assumption that Howard is also representative of humanity toiling under the gods. 
so that's the basics for Prometheus and Proteus, gods, titans, and humanity. Now let's take that and look in detail at what the film actually does with it. Please bear in mind that what we see on screen here are Egger's own interpretations of these characters, and the majority of our knowledge of ancient Greek mythology doesn't come from a single theological source like the Bible, it comes from many single interpretations, plays and histories and relief carvings on armour. So th these are interpretations of interpretations at work here, and I think it's fair to say that while Eggers no doubt based these on Proteus and Prometheus, as he claims, there are also certainly elements of Zeus and Poseidon, and many other elements of Greek mythology that we'll look at in detail, and indeed there will be points where notions and influences conflate, such as during the climactic battle where we see Wake with the visage of what is assumedly Proteus, yet it matches almost exactly with the description Wake gives of our father, meaning Poseidon. There's thunderclaps invoking Zeusian power, an extremely Olympian aesthetic to wake. Uh, as I've mentioned, he's more representative of the gods, specifically, in my opinion, the pantheon of Olympus, but also Abrahamic religions as well. With that being said, if we have to put a name on specific characters, it's Proteus for wake and Prometheus for Howard. All right, let's get into some finer detail. The very first thing we see Howard doing upon arriving inside the lighthouse is testing his limitations, understanding what he does and doesn't have access to, what's locked, where he sleeps. As he finally comes to a rest on his bed, he is promptly farted on by Wake. Immediately he is established as being of lesser station, below Wake, the one who is farted on. Frequently, in fact, uh, he's covered in the excrement of those above him. He exists in the sewer of Olympus, and the movie wants to constantly remind you of this. It's a genius move, because ultimately it's very difficult to look past the surface level of disgust that you feel, and you empathise with Howard at the discomfort of his situation. But subliminally, it's reminding you that he is beneath Wake. It's not just there to gross you out. And we see that hierarchy play out, literally in their positions in the lighthouse as well. Wake works at the top, with the light on Olympus. Howard toils and labours at the bottom, covered in fumes and coal and excrement. You could see it as Hades, or as Tartarus of sorts, but I see it more as the mortal realm with all the dirt and pain that goes along with being human. It's very quietly set up, but the film is obsessed with this hierarchy, and so is Howard's character. He recognises his station as lesser, and his primary outward desire is to transgress it. While he'll never discuss his sexual desires openly, or his uh, sanity, he will constantly speak about his desire to rise up the social hierarchy, be it through wealth, or position, or food, or assumed identities. To go back to the excessive bodily functions, again this is something that Greek mythology is obsessed with. The stories of the Olympians are filled with every bodily fluid going, and some extra ones they made up. The gods and the ancient Greeks had a certain fixation, from comedy to erotica, on all the wonderful gross things the human body can shoot out of itself, and it should be of no surprise then that we see Wake constantly subjecting Howard to such things. The first piece of defiance we see from Howard is rejection of alcohol. Later we'll see him reject Wake's cooking as well. He is rejecting the gifts of the gods, or rather what the gods deign to give him, rather than the prize he truly covets. On the subject of alcohol, and specifically Howard's madness, while it is again left unspoken, we are supposed to assume that Howard is a recovering alcoholic. This is the surface level reasoning for him being reluctant to drink with Wake. When he eventually succumbs and begins to drink, we see him lose control entirely and with total immediacy. It's a relapse, not a decline. This has been confirmed by Robert Pattinson, who describes his character as being early on in his attempted sobriety. Primarily though, the film focuses first on the backbreaking labour Howard is subjected to. He is not just the subject of Wake's cruel jokes and disgusting bodily functions, but also the slave-like workload Wake provides for him. He is man, labouring at the feet of the gods, and he is very unhappy with his position. We see Wake observing Howard's toil, note-taking in his logbook where he keeps all of Howard's sins and transgressions very much like interpretations of heaven, such as St. Paul at the gates, but more importantly for our reading, how the ancient Greek pantheon would track the deeds and transgressions of man, giving mortals preferential or punitive treatment depending on their feelings towards them. In fact, shortly after we first see him recording Howard's actions in his logbook, we're treated to a scene wherein Wake is high above Howard, dangling him precariously below. Now as we've covered, as well as being a phallic object, the lighthouse is also a symbol of hierarchy and station. The top is off limits to Howard due to his junior rank, and here that is highlighted perfectly with Wake gazing down at him as we're precariously reminded of Howard's mortality due to the risk of the situation. 
wake his god here, a Zeusian or Poseidon like figure towering above, and just to cement all of that, as this is going on, wake yells down to Howard, "'Tis fine work and you're making high marks in me logbook, that's gospel." The gospel provides a religious connotation to the work and what Howard is saying. The logbook, therefore, quickly becomes a moral register of Howard's character, one kept by Wake. It anchors Howard to his sins and quietly engenders this story as a struggle between humanity and the gods, something bigger than itself, something larger than what you're seeing on screen, a ship in a bottle, an extremely tight allegory, and it's very likely that that mystery, that feeling of something else lurking, is what brought you to this video looking for more answers. It's a beautiful, ugly movie, and now we're getting into the stuff that really makes it shine. A short while after his fall, Howard tries to have Wake address him as Ephraim Winslow instead of Lad, as Wake frequently does. This is another sign he wants to transgress, to move up and not be seen as a Lad at the very least. While he may want to transgress his subjugated position, he does not seem to want to do so as a compatriot, but as an opposition. Howard continues to refuse the gifts that the gods present him with, the alcohol, the food. Wake is clearly upset by this and demands he partake to the point of terrorising him. He seems legitimately sad that Howard does not like his food. Now at the surface, this is excellent tension building for their deteriorating relationship, but at a deeper level, this is man growing tired with the gifts the gods hand them. They don't want what they're being given, they want it all, they want the knowledge, they want the access the gods have to the wonders around them, and in Howard's case, that's all summed up in the light. At the point Howard and Wake get closest to friendship, we learn a few telling things. Howard is clearly eager to settle down with some earnings and doesn't like any of the working positions he's had. He's clearly very eager to move up in station. He wants his own roof somewhere away from people with no one to tell him what for. He despises being ruled. When Howard is supposedly unable to remember Wake's prayer, he instead toasts to relief, which I think is pretty explanatory, but for posterity, it's supposed to mean a relief to their guard on the lighthouse uh, on the surface, but on a subtextual level, it almost certainly refers to sexual release. He also asks Wake if he ever feels shame when he lies with a woman. Now if this is something that concerns Howard, we can be pretty certain that he'd be ashamed of laying with a man. And lastly, in this moment of friendship, Howard again requests access to the lamp. This sours the mood and has Wake explain that the light is his, that Howard may get his own lamp room, but it won't be on Wake's rock. This to me is very clear allegory for the light being taken from the rock of Olympus. Now perhaps the most frustrated we see Howard get with his position or earthly station is during his drunken argument with Wake where he screams, I want a steak, if I had a steak, oh boy, if I had a steak I would fuck it. A steak is certainly a signifier of affluence, of wealth and comfort and luxury. At the surface here, we see Howard frustrated that he is isolated without rations. A little deeper, and we can recognise that this stake is a reference to the wider things that Howard wants, the wealth and transgression of his position to a higher station, his Promethean quest to transgress the gods. But as we also know, that quest for Howard is very much centred around sexual relief, and here may be the most crystal clear the movie ever makes it, if he had a stake he would fuck it. And that is essential to our reading because it demonstrates his growing confusion between what he wants, what he's always wanted, and his growing sexual confusion. It also demonstrates his debasement, his movement away from the natural order. He's fantasizing about having sex with fish women, voyeuristically attending his male co-worker, killing gulls, and now he's drunkenly fantasizing about having sex with dead cows. Now obviously there's a degree of humor there, but I think it's mainly delivered that way so that what I'm describing isn't too obvious or too explicit. It's also followed up with a comment about Howard not liking Wake's cooking and the reply of, oh you all bitch, which is again pretty funny but also quite significant. While it may first have the feel of drunken comedy, Wake gets unnaturally upset that Howard doesn't like his food, that he refused his gifts. Like even for Wake, the reaction is extreme here, kind of like Achilles' reaction over Patroclus' death. There simply must be something more there. Now in Achilles' case, that's been read as familial or romantic love, but in Wake's case, I think the most literal explanation is his own loneliness and isolation. Wake always talks about the men he's worked with, the women he's loved. Perhaps he's simply disappointed that he thought he was developing a camaraderie with Howard or a friendship. Ultimately though, we know there's more going on here than that, and I think this ties back into our mythological reading. Wake's Olympian figure is terrified. The mortals have rejected his gifts, the titans are rebelling, and he fears usurpation is next. He fears he will lose the light, and so he begs Howard to say he likes his lobster, to say he will not reject the gods, even though they will not allow him the nectar of the light, the Promethean fire that he seeks. 
And if you think I'm just making all of this up, let's let the scene continue. Wake stands up and screams, let Neptune strike you dead, Winslow. He immediately calls on the Roman equivalent of Poseidon. Not only that, but as he curses Winslow, there is a thundercrack in line with his arm movements, suggesting Zeusian power at his beck and call. He continues with Hark Triton, Triton being another son of Poseidon. And although he calls out Neptune, his call to Triton regards our father the Sea King, slightly confirming his position as Proteus. I'll put the whole quote on screen just because it's beautiful. So as you can see, it's a mammoth unloading of rage, of godlike damnings, the kind of which are rife through Greek mythology. The linguistic hallmarks of maritime masculinity and the Shakespearean drama of Greek mythology retold through contemporary performance. It's an utterly genius stretch of writing. And as his rage grows, he looks more and more like a fearsome and wild Poseidon. It's also one of the few, if only times, that Howard looks fearful of Wake's words. He is otherwise standoffish until he's reminded of his junior position, and that his obstinance may get in the way of his earnings. He has rebuked the gods here, the natural order, and now he has incurred their wrath and is for the first time fearful. I think this is very clearly demonstrating Wake's rage as godlike. Slightly later on, Howard makes it clear that his murder of Winslow, or the accidental death claim as he tells it, is beneficial to him in that it means he can transgress his station and move up the social hierarchy. He says, well Ephraim Winslow has a spiffy clean slate, and Thomas Howard, well, he don't. This also alludes to further dark behaviour in Howard's past. Now, we've already discussed its ties to mythology, but this scene follows Howard telling Wake the truth about Winslow and a haunting trailing shot with Wake narrating, why'd you spill your beans to me lad? So I thought I'd just give a little bit more detail on what that meant. So he's told the gods of his transgression in the form of what he's done to Winslow, and now he must be punished. Another quick point, the immaculate imagery in this scene continues as we see Proteus and Prometheus positioned in exact visual reference to Hypnosis by German painter Sascha Schneider. Howard's final rant at Wake when he compares him to his father and tells him how sick he is of snoring and his goddamn farts is his ultimate refusal of the gods. It's also worth noting that Howard's getting very extreme here in how he describes Wake and how it's very graphic and penis focused. And although outwardly it comes from a place of disgust, it does again demonstrate how Howard regards Wake in a sexual manner. Even if it's confusing or disgusted, it's graphically sexual nonetheless. Howard's final rejection and murder of Wake comes after reading aloud from his book of deeds or misgivings. The logbook of Wake writing down every sin or possible sin Howard has committed, and again here we have huge overtones of man and gods. Man feels fallible, as if he was built by God to be able to fail, and rejects God's judgement when it's God that built that failure within them. It's rage, rejection, and Wake seemingly finds it disappointing and humorous, the patronising reaction of a god. The final fight, wherein the different images we see of Howard choking Wake, of Winslow, the Siren, the crusty, barnacled Wake as Proteus, this is the climax manifestation of Howard's psychosexual confusion as he breaks down into his final lusty barbarism. He sees the man he potentially had sexual relations with, and almost certainly murdered, that Ephraim Winslow. He sees the recent mystic locus of his sexual fantasies, the Siren, and he sees a supernatural, terrifying visage of Wake as Proteus. Wake is the apex of this psychosexual confusion. He presents a target of both rage and desire to Howard, and his only resolution is violence, and very probably sexual assault. The hands go very quickly from choking to neck caressing in reverse of how Howard touched the siren earlier. His confusion between sexuality and violence playing in reverse as he seeks his relief. We see him standing over Wake holding his crotch in presumed arousal as we've seen him do throughout the film and telling Wake's character to bark. Now this is ultimate rebellion to authority. Both Winslow and Wake repeatedly called him a dog, and now he uses it as an extremely troubling sign of submission. Once Wake submits and barks for him, he stands over him further and calls him a good boy, and then says, now roll over with a hard cut to end the scene. I think it's pretty clear what's happened there, and we've already covered everything that's going on with that, but yes, it is probable that we are meant to read that as his refusal of authority, and his refusal to be sexually frustrated or concerned by his own barbarism. He takes authority, he takes sexual relief, and he does so with the violent sexual subjugation of Wake. He then leashes Wake and continues his treatment of him like a canine, a canine being deliberately lower than human. Howard has transgressed his authority hierarchy by making Wake metaphorically and literally beneath him. Following Wake's burial by Howard, he runs back in and attacks him with an axe, burying it in Howard's shoulder. Howard strikes him with a kettle and then kills him with the axe. 
Now I think on the surface level this probably isn't happening. Howard is imagining in his madness that he's in some paranoid battle for the light, when in all reality he has probably raped and buried a man alive. He certainly doesn't seem very bothered by the axe in his shoulder, nor his weight covered in soil or earth when he runs in. On the subtextual allegorical level though, this is Prometheus' final slaying of Proteus. Humanity and the Titans rejecting the rule of Olympus, of being the toilet of the gods, of living in the sewer of their supposed superiority. The natural order, the gods are overthrown, and barbarism and sexual depravity reign supreme. And then, our Prometheus finally gets his light. I just need to break off for a moment to say that these shots are some of my favourite on screen ever in anything. They're crazy and chaotic, but somehow restrained and ugly and beautiful all at the same time. I'm not convinced this was a movie that needed to happen, but it's damn near perfect in how it's constructed, and I think this final scene of Howard being eclipsed by the madness of his own desires is the apex of this beautiful, amazing film. Seriously cool, as I'm sure you already pick up, they really cement the notion of the film's aesthetic becoming more ultra-noir, high contrast, and less realist as a reflection of Howard's mental state. Contrast, saturation, everything here moves from realism to almost photo-negative quality in line with Howard's final descent into complete lunacy and loss of self. Once Howard tumbles down the stairs, rejected by the light he sought, he is knocked unconscious, and we see lucidity return, and the realism to noir shift occurs in reverse, with a beautiful, opposing shot of the spiral staircase. Then, finally, we get another incredible shot of Howard in full Promethean torment, being perpetually torn apart by gulls as Prometheus was. Now, I don't think there's much interpretation left at this point. The real Howard, driven mad by the events, died bleeding at the bottom of the staircase. There's no way he was getting naked and crawling outside just to be attacked by birds. But here, as we see before, we see the allegory playing out, the conclusion of Proteus versus Prometheus. Prometheus got his light, he got his violent transgression, but he also receives perpetual torment for his crime. In the wake of his sexual transgressions and violent barbarism, Howard finally starts paying for his viciousness, his desires, his repressed urges, and his desire above all else to seek relief in the light. So one last quick section regarding madness and whether or not Wake killed his predecessor and whether or not Howard really murdered Winslow. So I think it's entirely possible that Wake is as mad as Howard. It certainly begins to feel that way for a time around three quarters of the way through. But ultimately, I read it as mainly the ravings of Howard as he succumbs to madness. Really, this interpretation is left open for you to decide, but personally, I believe Wake when he says he has nothing to confess and that Howard smashed up the lifeboat and so on. For me at least, the majority of Wake's extreme behaviour we see is likely just Howard's madness. He just moves back in to total lucidity quite quickly after these events, going from seeming entirely mad to altogether irrational in an instant. He's also concerned with things like Howard and his sanity and his identity, while Howard seemingly just loses himself more and more and doesn't question or mention these things out loud. During the moments of clarity where Wake explains Howard's madness to him, we again see the more realist aesthetic return, as if Howard is coming back to reality for a moment as Wake makes him realise how dangerously delusional he's become. We, the audience following Howard, are brought back to reality with him, using that realist aesthetic, which to me at least has a big impact on what events we're seeing truthfully and which we see through the lens of madness. For example, Howard thinks the boat has only been late by a day. Wake insists it's been weeks since they missed her. This dissonance happens several times. Ultimately, as I said, it's there to generate confusion and a creeping sense of madness in the viewer. But watching it through the second time, with my reading that we're viewing the lens specifically through Howard, I think the memory skip on part of the viewer and Howard is legitimate, and Wake is telling the truth that he's been telling Howard to ration for weeks. Howard seems confused, and once again exclaims that he thought relief was coming. Relief, release his boat back to the mainland, another link between Howard's isolation and his sexual frustration. His escape from this place is deliberately described as relief. For the most part, I think the insanity that causes confusion to the storyline is Howard's, but undoubtedly Wake is quite mad too, just more in a salty old sea dog kind of way. His altering story about how he injured his leg seems to be consistent with his old hat madness, but it's more of an aged confusion than a dangerous insanity. Another plus for us viewing the movie through Howard's lens is that these memory skips and inconsistencies occur from the point at which Howard starts consuming alcohol. Now, did Wake kill Howard's predecessor? 
After Wake strikes Howard over the seabird, the aesthetics show us this looming, lurking threat that hangs over Howard through the use of his shadow overcast on the ceiling. Wake seems legitimately terrified of what Howard might do, maybe of something that happened to him before, as it will do with Howard later on. Perhaps he's just remembering the darkness of behaviour he's seen in isolated sailors before. Given the context of the conversation they are having, the mesmerising pull of the light and his predecessor's mysterious fate, we must consider that Wake's abject and sudden terror could stem from Howard's predecessor. Suffering from the same isolation, frustration and sexual confusion as Howard, potentially maybe he also tried to rape or at the least attack Wake, and this resulted in either his eventual suicide out of shame or simply his dismissal from the post. But that is purely hypothetical and this sudden terror at Howard's looming figure is explained easily enough by our Prometheus using his physical power to usurp Wake's Proteus. It's unlikely that Wake murdered Howard's predecessor, because although we see Wake's character as being comfortable with violence at various points in their downward spiral, he is never really comfortable with murder. Unlike Howard, Wake respects the natural order. He respects the hierarchy, the nature around them, such as the Gull. He values the lives and sanities of those he has sailed with in the past and frequently prays for the living to be spared by the gods. He may be mad, and he may be cruel in places, but he seems to have a strict code of ethics. This is in opposition to Howard, who repeatedly demonstrates himself as being unable to control his base desires and actions. He murders, he rapes, he wants, and he demands. He is man, angry at his place, at the foundations of this metaphysical hierarchy. Wake is the gods, desperate to maintain the status quo in the face of violent rebellion. On the subject of Howard's murder of Winslow, we see Howard recount how Winslow died. He claims it was accidental that he thought about doing him in with the cod hook, the spear we see in the flashback. But he claims that he actually died in a logging accident that Howard simply didn't assist in any kind of rescue. This seems very rehearsed. Likely the story that he told the other people at the logging camp, or perhaps the story he tells himself. I'm going to say straight up that I think this is a lie, and here's why. When we see this moment in his memory and his fantasies, he does not see himself staring down at Winslow, abstaining from pulling him up. That would be the moment of trauma. Instead, he, he remembers the moment of the codhook hovering behind Winslow, presumably the actual moment of the murder. The scene is shot with the more uh, unreal aesthetic, heavy contrast noir rather than historical realism, and mostly Winslow's role in his confusion between sexuality and violence suggests that something violent occurred between the two men, not simply the absence of aid in a time of peril. If this really was just an accidental death in which Howard didn't commit murder, then why does it prey so deeply within his sexual fantasies? Why take on the man's name? An accidental death just doesn't make sense in so many ways here, not least how much it dominates Howard's psyche. It doesn't fit at all with anything else we know, and the film has gone to great lengths to demonstrate Howard not just as someone who lies to the audience and other characters, but also someone whose memory cannot be trusted. The admission ends with Howard staring directly at the camera, in a moment that is reminiscent of the ending shot of Psycho, which obviously again suggests he's lying. It's quickly revealed that Wake isn't actually in the room, although inexplicably later he seemingly was there for this explanation. Again, showing us it's Howard's memory that can't be trusted. I mean, Wake could hardly have forgotten himself from a memory, as they would be his memories. Howard directly addressing the camera, followed by the admission that he's alone in the room, is a significant and deliberate fourth wall break. And I think that's there because if you're viewing this for the first time, this is really the moment where the movie wants you to start calling Howard's sanity into question. Up until this moment, the first viewing makes it seem more as if Wake is the insane one that he's just making mistakes and that our young narrator, the protagonist, is the one that can be trusted. But here, Howard breaks the fourth wall. He asks the viewer a question, how else am I going to find respectable work, while staring directly into the camera? And given the visual references to Psycho and the certainty that his viewpoint can't be trusted, I think it's pretty clear that we're supposed to realise he's asking us to buy into his lies. Do we think he's a respectable person? Later on, Wake will accuse Howard of killing the gull, something we know that he did, a murder he certainly committed, and he will also lie about it. I think one final indicator on the surface level of what's happening and what's not are the comments made in Wake's logbook, which I view as 100% legitimate. Again, this scene is purposefully shot with lucidity and clarity, and both men seem to be certain of what is being read out loud. No disagreement there. The difference, Howard is in disbelief of it, and Wake responds calmly that Howard lies to himself, and I think that is entirely accurate. On the surface level, I think the drunken anger Wake often displays is legitimate. 
he, his rants at Howard berating him about work and such, but for the most part, 90% of Wake's supposed lunacy that we see, the real wacky stuff like running around screaming with an axe, is actually just Howard's madness, Howard's perception. In truth, over time, Wake has identified and logged Howard's increasingly dangerous and insane behaviour. Although this battle of sanity is only occurring on a surface level, in terms of our advanced allegory of Proteus and Prometheus, I think it's an eternal struggle, with both being wrong in their own ways, and I think the engine driving all of this is sexual frustration and repressed homosexuality, the battle for relief, the battle for light, and transgression of authority. And I think that's everything guys, if you can't tell I love this movie, I could talk about it for days and I'm actually considering doing a sort of commentary for it that you can play alongside the movie because it's just so rich with material. I think whatever your reading of the film is, you're probably right, it's so multi-layered and deep in meaning that there's a variety of different ways you can unpack it. I've tried to be as complete as possible here but there's so much that more that can be said. I mean, I barely touched on the role of alcohol and the influences of movies like Whiskey Galore. Christian imagery is plentiful and I barely touched on that too. There's a number of literary influences I haven't mentioned like Heart of Darkness and H.P. Lovecraft, so there's still some pieces to discuss, but I've tried to give an extensive and complete review here of what I think is going on. Let me know what your responses were to the film down in the comments and hopefully we can discuss some of the things that we've missed out. I think for better or worse, Robert Pattinson was channeling Daniel Plainview and he's probably going to make a very good Batman, especially if Matt Reeves goes for a noir detective aesthetic as rumours suggest because he just looks incredible in every shot here. Thank you so much for watching guys and thank you so much again to those of you who have sent well wishes to me. Suffice to say, a month in hospital has not been fun, but all being well, I'm on the bend now. Alright guys, thanks again, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace out.